I'm back. So, uh, in the past years, you've seen video kind of explode everywhere. Uh, Facebook's made this clear, they've gone all in on video. Uh, Cisco says they project video increasing four times by 2021. B2B companies are finally seeing the light. They're seeing video as a very powerful medium for their messages. And I just want to kind of get a show of hands of who's here today. How many of you guys are just getting into video or haven't started yet but are interested? Raise your hand. Okay, about 20, 10%. And how many of you guys have already been using it successfully? Okay. Okay, so you guys are fairly seasoned. I'll introduce myself. My name is Alan Martinez. I'm the founder of Noble Digital, um, a digital marketing agency, or your creative production agency, actually, in Southern California. Uh, we primarily focus on digital marketing. Uh, that means building brands, uh, funnels. It means websites, apps, videos, you name it. I got my start at the Art Center College of Design, where I was on track to be a creative director, so I've learned all kinds of content production flows, uh, photography, video, websites, graphic design, you name it. Uh, one of my teachers there was Linda Wyman. You may know her from lynda.com, that was her platform. She sold to LinkedIn for $1.5 billion, and if I was smart, I would have continued on that path. <laughs> but instead, I chose to be a filmmaker, a director. And so I'm gonna show you a piece I did as a student. Uh, let me give you some context what you're about to watch, okay? This was done in the 1900s, no joke. Uh, this is when CGI was just coming out with video. Uh, today you can buy templates, you can buy wireframes, you can assemble this pretty quickly now. This was done from scratch. This took months and months of work, hour, months of rendering uh, on mainframe computers. It wasn't on a Mac. I could probably do this in a couple days now, but I'm just gonna give you context of the blood, sweat, and tears. I even had like this film students kind of saying like, what is, th they don't understand what we're doing, so check this out. Hey, you, over here. Hey, you want a piece of me or what? All right, pal. Put it right in the old pocket. Ole. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still standing. Hey! So I was kind of in the Coen Brothers Hudsucker Proxy, kind of paying homage to Bugs Bunny and Tex Avery. That's where it came from. But uh, this got me around town, and I was lucky enough to get hired by Quentin Tarantino's company, A Band Apart. Uh, and they had a new com commercial division and they wanted someone young to kind of go with their whole troop of directors that they already had there. And so I was kind of launched into the whole Hollywood system. I worked with these Hollywood crews which are amazing. They're some of the best on the planet. I can say that because I filmed all over the planet. They're amazing. And I'm not gonna even talk about that today, okay? <laughs> We're gonna talk about how to make money. Um, I'm holding a storyboard. These guys are laser focused on my board because this commercial is gonna run every day, uh, several times a day across several channels for over a year. There's $100 million of media spend behind this one video, okay? So this is video at scale. Um, over the years, I've been really fortunate enough to work with some of the most amazing brand managers, and somehow they've entrusted me with about $25 billion of media spend behind the work I've produced for them. And so you're gonna see a lot of the companies I've worked with, they're all over the gamut. They, they are telecoms, uh, SaaS platforms, API, uh, you know, food, and even, um, uh, outdated uh, video rental companies, but <laughs> uh, I've even done a film with Milo. Any uh, This Is Us fans? Yeah, Gilmore Girls, right. Uh, he, I don't know if he takes his shirt off, I don't remember, but <laughs> check it out, Prime Video. You, uh, it's actually for uh, free if you watch it on Prime Video. Um, but it sounds like I'm all over the place, but the fact is creators work across horizontals and verticals. This is because we're basically trained to engineer experiences around a human storytelling vibe. When we deal with like a, a startup, for example, uh, these are some of the investors that have been involved with uh, the clients that we serve. We like to look at a startup from the, the whole picture. We like to get a whole picture of what's going on. This is the business model canvas. This is a picture of your entire company. And so we focus on where we can create value. And we tend to focus on value on this side of the spectrum. And we do that with creative content. We do that with Funnels, we do that with uh, Facebook campaigns, pr programmatic, you name it, okay? And so if we were to actually break this all down in a bunch of elements, it looks something like this. This is how we build something from scratch or this is how we actually diagnose a company when they're having problems with their flow. 
We're not going to talk about any of that today, though. We're going to talk about just video. But I want to show it this way because video is not this isolated thing. It should fit into an entire experience, and that's part of the problem why some of your videos don't perform as well as it should. Quick question, which one of these three account for 80% of a campaign success? How many believe it's the right message? Raise your hand. A couple. How many believe it's the right time? How many believe it's the right place? How many believe, have no idea what I'm talking about right now? Okay. The, the, <laughs> The answer is the right message. These are kind of the three pillars of what makes a campaign work. <laughs> Andrew Robertson made this clear uh, when he confirmed this through Facebook's data and Google North America's data that the right message accounts for 80% of the return path. And I confirmed this also with smaller SMB um, statistics where it didn't matter whether I'm talking about B2C or B2B, it was pretty much kind of saying the same thing. And what that means to you guys is that instead of focusing so much of your energy on all these placement and timing platforms uh, and, and tech and tools, it's only about 20% of the impact that you're gonna have when someone's actually considering you guys, right? So you need to focus on your creative message first and foremost. And that's, now that you understand this, when you see a prompt like this in Facebook asking about, are you running the best placements? That's not the right question to ask. They're a media company, of course they're gonna ask that. They're not gonna get into your business about your creative because that's not what they do, okay? The real question is, are you running the best ads for your objective? Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to optimize your video before you start to promote it, okay? And some of you marketers are thinking, how is that possible, Alan? I need my feedback loop. We'll get into that. But we have to be a little bit more proactive about this. So first and foremost, your brand and your business need to be tethered tightly. And that's one of the biggest problems I see. When I, someone asks me to make a video, I'm going right to here. I'm, I'm saying, okay, what are you guys about? What are your users about? And if I don't get really clear answers, that's really where we need to focus some of our energy. And then once we have that figured out, then we wrap that around in a story. The problem I see a lot in a lot of companies is that they're using a different kind of workflow than what I would use. They're using crisis and management workflows to do something creative. And this kind of workflow leaves no room for insights, no critical thinking, let alone creativity, okay? So you can't really let new ideas flourish uh, in, this, in this kind of, uh, climate, right? So Brian Chesky made this clear when he said the designing of an experience uses a different part of your brain than the scaling of that experience. And he really understands this separation between uh, executing and actually ideating something. Okay. So make sure that you plan enough and, and figure this out ahead of time. If you don't, you're going to start getting prompts like this where Facebook's telling you to cut your video in half. That's epic failure. So invest in ideation. Put some proper time and don't put that on a, a clock deadline. Uh, frameworks, um, they're nice, that's a great starting point. A lot of times I see frameworks uh, as an ending point <laughs> sometimes too. And so make sure that you're actually getting what you really want in your head, the vision that you were hoping for. Make sure that you're dealing, you're getting fidelity out of the piece that you want. Now if you're a startup and just getting going, maybe you don't need full fidelity. Uh, but then again, you know, if you don't look quite as polished as you need to be, that could be a problem. So it's really, a, what I'm talking about here is getting what you pay for. So it's really up to you. So this gap between strategy and execution really stems from the users and your product market fit. And we need your brand messaging house to be in order. Uh, this is just a front facing slide, but there's actually all this is documented. It goes really deep on each pillar and the foundation. And this informs everything that we're gonna make across the entire funnel. A funnel is meaningless without this. Um, I'm not gonna even talk about this today, but if you ever want to talk to me, I, we can go deeper on that. So another view of where video sits is I'm assuming that you have this foundation of your branding and messaging down to a T. Story comes from thesis and antithesis. Your thesis is your product. Your antithesis is your customer's pain points, okay? And that tension between them being brand loyal or not even understanding why they need to go with you is that story you need to tell them until they have a change. This is nothing new. This came from Aristotle's Poetics. He defined these key metrics around emotion and, and the changes in an emotion, all the crises that happened 2,000 years ago and still being used today. If we take just one point, let's look at a beat. Skylar says, this is uh, Walt's wife. Where, where, where were you? So that's a loaded question for anybody to, to take, right? You have to understand this is built upon other scenes, okay? Every scene is built upon multiple beats. 
and each of those scenes build upon like sequences. So when you start to map this all out, you have sequences, you have acts, and then you have your whole story here. And then on top of this, you have to layer in all these different episodes and build up to a climax at the end of the season and then go on for years and years. This is story design. Okay, so when you think of a screenwriter building out a character for a film, it's not that different than creating a customer profile. And by the way, marketers, you guys are worried about someone watching your video for 30 seconds. This guy's got people hooked for years. <laughs> think about that. You guys need story, okay? It's not that different, it's very similar. Our KPIs are emotional goals, okay? Did the actor have an emotion? If you, they have an emotion, you're gonna have an emotion and you're gonna feel something. That's it, that's what story's about. Marketing needs more of that because if, if they feel something, then they're gonna take action, okay? And so if you look at the three-act structure through the lens of marketing, it's really your customer journey. And it starts from the one end to, I, I don't want it, I don't, I'm not interested, I already got the brand I like. Well, it looks kind of interesting, maybe I'll try it, to, okay, I'll give it a shot, to, oh, it's actually pretty good. And then, wow, this is actually pretty amazing. I want to tell all my friends about this. That's it. And that's why we can work across any company, B2B, e-com, doesn't matter, because it's that same story, but then customizing that journey so that people actually feel something along the way. Now, Aristotle also contributed to modern marketing. He said, all persuasive arguments must have three elements in order to be effective. He called these elements the appeals. The three appeals were ethos, logos, and pathos. So I know a lot of you guys are thinking, like, this is where all your marketing is working. This is where the intent is at, right? And so, you know, you have your case studies, your explanation, that's logic, it's an argument to, uh, to reason. And then who are you guys? What's, you know, what are you guys about? What do your, what do your customers say about you? This is pretty much what marketing's been, digital marketing's been for 15 years. What you're missing is that top layer. And you're thinking like, Alan, but all the intents there, why would I even bother to build that top funnel? Well, have you ever taken a look at what search might look like at any given hour of any given day? It looks a lot like this, okay? It's a very tough space to be in. People are not in their heart, they're in their mind. They've already made their mind up, they're already brand loyal, they're not listening to you. A lot of things are going on there that you're com combating. So when you start to introduce pathos, uh, and this is what he said, not me. Uh, Aristotle said, ethos and logos are irrelevant in the absence of pathos, which is emotion. Um, the reason why you need this is because there's, there's low friction at the top. People haven't even made a decision about what they're gonna do. They might not even know that they need you yet, right? And this is a, a wonderful place to be at. And so people are more curious, they're more open, and they're able to recall you better because um, you're telling them a story. Uh, it, it, video allows you to create a space in the user's mind. so they. Remember that. I mean, when's the last time you guys remembered the last AdWords sentence that you saw? Anybody? <laughs> what you say early in the sales cycle is far more influential than what you say late in the sales cycles, according to Gong's data. They also said competitive deals are won early when the battleground is fertile. Competitive deals are won with discovery techniques, not closing techniques. Can a video have all three at the same time? Silence. So you can say yes. Yes? No? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm going to show you a case study. Um, I was excited to have a chance to help a startup using all the best practices I learned from bigger brands. I was wondering, would it work for a small startup? They did not have $100 million of media spend, not even a tenth of that, not even a fraction of that. So uh, let's see how it turned out. In this video, we're going to show you exactly how our campaign for Plated.com helped them get to $100 million in revenue in just 18 months' time. New on the scene, Plated.com was a funded startup freshly financed by Shark Tank investors, so they needed to scale up fast. Noble Digital stepped in to help them launch their national TV spot. Plated needed to capture new trials and long-term customers. It was clear that a video of just slow-motion food shots would not be compelling enough for an impactful launch, so the foundation for creating their brand response video started by interpreting Plated's data and surveys to help us find the seed for the big idea that would position Plated as uniquely as possible. In the strategy phase, I had to channel the signal from the noise, sifting through a sea of data until I zeroed in on a set of polarizing keywords that helped me transform Plated's user profiles into memorable characters and a storyline that customers could quickly identify with. As a result of listening to our audience's needs and concerns, the, the video I designed contained multiple layers of communication. So on one layer, the video eliminated sales objections. For example, Plated's food is thoughtfully packed at the source, but surveys revealed that their packaging was quite important to our savvy, health-conscious audience. So I handled this by integrating the packaging on screen without losing the narrative flow. 
The data and keywords also helped me focus and identify the pain points of the urban lifestyle that Plated helped solve. So everything was strategically designed so that when potential customers saw the video, it would feel as if they were watching a cinematic story about themselves, not an advertisement. When surveys came back, it showed that 83 out of 100 people would try Plated upon seeing the video just once. An 83% response rate was a great sign, but would the marketplace match the same result? Our video ranked in the top three spot within just weeks of airing. The TV metrics platform iSpot TV confirmed this. iSpot's score of 8.6 out of 9.9 .9 maximum was derived from their formula, which tracks behavioral patterns from first screen to second screen searches within a 10 minute window of airing, all driven by three different calls to action. Based on customer actions, iSpot's listening tools could attribute searches to our unique links, and the results clearly show that we outperformed the industry average by almost double. The most profound impact, according to iSpot TV data, is that our video for Plated outperformed their much bigger competitor, Blue Apron, by twice as much but only using half the media spend. The video started as a 30-day test that continued to outperform in its category for an additional 18 months straight, running nationally several times a day. Plated more than doubled their working capital from new investors since the video's launch in January 2015. Proof that even small brands can use big brand strategies to succeed and scale. But the story doesn't end there. It's the largest exit ever. They can't tell you what it was, but I'm an investor, and I will. $300 million. This is huge, and it just gives you an idea of how the American dream can play out on Shark Tank. These guys are a classic Shark Tank story excellent in executional skills in marketing and logistics. You know, we, it's been a hell, of a hell of a ride the last five years and we wouldn't be here without supporters like, like Kevin and our early investors and, you know, to all the haters out there, like, we did it. So, a one month test turned into 18 months of nonstop customer acquisition. It's pretty nice. Um, I wanna give you a counter to that, just to be fair. Uh, Potato Parcel, which is another Shark Tank company, was nice enough to let me show some numbers. Uh, they're getting a two and a half return on their uh, investment and ad spend. <clears throat> and uh, they can't run it all the time. They have a different business model. It's not for everybody, it's very niche, but they can run around like holidays and certain sales cycles that they understand, but they know their business very well and it's working for them. So it really depends on your business. Um, and he said to himself, videos everything now, when it comes to ads, I really run static image ads on Facebook anymore. AdWords for us is a very passive investment. It's all about grabbing attention. He said it, not me. And so, how much did you spend on your video? I have no idea, I really don't. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll just say that it, it should be uh, tethered to your business goals, okay? So I wanna shatter something uh, right now, right here. Uh, the Dollar Shave Club fantasy. You're gonna spend $4,500 and you're gonna make millions like Dollar Shave Club. Um, it's just not true, the CEO was an actor, pulled the favor from a production company, and they said it should cost $50,000 actually. You, you don't think twice about hiring talent when it comes to your, to your company. So you have to think about your asset as something that should drive uh, performance. So a salesperson, you're gonna pay them a quarter million dollars a year, they better be bringing in millions of dollars a year of revenue, right? You, it's just, just math. And the same respect, so should your video. Okay, video can do this. I just showed you an example, and I've been doing it for a while. Um, it does work. Uh, the video will work for you 24 hours a day, won't take a vacation. And what's interesting about video is this, I'm being very conservative here. More than one person can watch a video at the same time. Thousands and millions can watch it at the same time. When you start doing it at that scale, then it becomes like 24 cents an hour. <laughs> so um, this is what these people are doing here in this image. It means something more now that I've shared some things with you. Uh, they're, they're holding their video accountable. And at the top is where you wanna invest the most money. It's got the least friction. Um, and this is equivalent to like your land, you know, landing page of your website. If people don't get past this, they're never gonna get to your website. So it becomes very important. Don't confuse videographers with filmmakers. A videographer can be great at filming, editing, maybe do some motion graphics, which is great, but sometimes you might need an entire ensemble to create something very powerful. And these are kind of the crews I work with. Um, I'm gonna show you really quickly, uh, I'm gonna stack several workflows because I'm managing separate teams, they're all creative, but they're not talking to each other until they come to the day of the set, which is crazy, right? So this is what it looks like. This guy is doing some tech research for me. I'm trying to figure out if I can map something onto a body. It's new and we're playing with it. We're having issues with it, as you're gonna see. It's not quite following him. We have a latency issue. You don't need to worry about what that means. That's what you hired us for. <laughs> but then my choreographer is taking my story that I wanna tell, interpreting it, and telling the dancer a story that she's interpreting from my story, okay? 
which I got from the client. So the client down to me, down to the team. This is my post effects guys who are also contributing to the story of how we're gonna use special effects to enhance that story. And so when we finally arrive on the day to shoot everything, everyone's together, my cinematographer is working with me and the lighting crew is working with me to make sure that everything is in alignment with the story that we wanna tell, okay? And so when you put everything together and you mar all this together, you end up with the story. And it becomes more powerful because you have an ensemble of people looking at it. And of course, besides the video, we ended up with a bunch of still imagery too, so you can repurpose this as well. That's why branding is so important because you start to see more opportunities. We didn't even plan to do any still images, but we actually pulled it out out of our test for the graphic design. It just looked beautiful. So <clears throat> this is why video is so powerful. The, this one, the one medium that has all these other artistic mediums within it, right? And you have to manage all that. This is where I want you to focus your energy. Story, branding, performances, emotion. Stay in your lane. It will, it will give you years back of your life, okay? And if you're wondering how do I start, this is how you would start. With data. I bet you didn't think a creative guy was gonna talk about data, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, check this out. So uh, this is a flow I'm gonna share that kind of I'm used to from um, working with bigger brands. And some of you guys already do it, some of you do part of this, but we start with quantitative data and you're just trying to get insights. What's going on in the marketplace? What are the users doing? And it might look like a sea of data, which you saw in the plated video. This is what I was helping them with. They came to me and <clears throat> said, we want to make a video. It was basically like a, these slow motion shots of food. And I was like, why? It was not really, they weren't even using the data they had to figure out what the story should be. So you would go through the sea of that data and you would find, they, they would create a marketing brief which would define what they need to do, okay? That marketing brief, would then need to get some data synthesis where we're gonna refine uh, the qualitative aspects of what the, the data should be doing. I'll, and I'll show you right here, and this, this is a nice example I just found online, but quantitative data is the black and white factual things that you wanna do. The qualitative part is the touchy feeling. So you're taking what the business strategy wants to do and you're turning to something outward facing for users to, to feel something. Um, and then you wanna kind of like, you don't wanna show the, the seams, so to speak. You wanna have this be seamless, okay? Uh, most of the time, I, I never get this. <laughs> Unless it's a really big company, I get maybe the red part or maybe just the objective and that's it. And so that's what was happening in the plated thing. I was like, ah, I, what are we doing here, right? So you go through those insights and you might find one, okay? Children typically share their bedroom when they have a single parent. And it may, it's not sexy, is it? It's not really emotional, not really a story, right? And so someone somewhere creative goes, hey, what if we captured the moment when a child got their own room? Wouldn't that be cool? And that's where you talk with the C-suite. You say, hey, I have an idea. And they, you pitch it to them. They say, oh, that's kind of cool. But see, our user is actually the mom. It's not the kid. Yeah, but then the creative's thinking like, do you want emotion or not? <laughs> the mom is always gonna take care of your kid first. He's gonna, whatever, he's gonna pitch why it should be that way or not. It's a, it's a discussion, it's a, it's, it's a collaborative dialogue, okay? So I'm gonna show you an example. This is for Zillow. Um, just when you watch it, notice the emotions that you're feeling, okay? We're gonna talk about this wheel afterwards. Here we go. Today at lunch, me and my what? friends. You got the notice too? Looks like we're all moving. Mama, I don't wanna move. I know, sweetie. I don't want to move either. See you after school. <laughs> Love you. This is our room? Nope. No. This is my room. Gonna be right. I know. I know. <gasps> Zillow, find your way home. So the arc there, we talk people talk character arc, story arcs. The arc was going from this pensive, like, what's gonna happen? We don't know, to joy. Uh, and the app kind of helped them get through that seamlessly. Um, if you notice, the, the app kind of took a back seat, which is kind of cool, and they made it about the users. This is what we mean by user-centric storytelling. It's not just a term, it actually means something. And I'm also showing this because if you look at this, there was two people in an empty room. That costs nothing. <laughs> Natural sunlight, okay? So you can make a connection without spending a lot of money. When you see spectacles, spectacles like Super Bowl commercials, there's big explosions, there's car crashes. You don't always need that. It's nice, I like to shoot that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, now that you understand this, I, can I don't even show the videos. You know the Snickers ads? They're going from aggressiveness to acceptance based on their key insight. And then they just go, they lean into that and they make version after version after version of the same exact key insight and do variations on that, 
Very creative. Which major brand dug into self-loathing and towards, moved towards self-acceptance as a main part of their campaign strategy? Who would do such a thing? Dove. Uh, they want to feature real women, never models. They want to portray women as they are in real life. This is really important to these guys. I'm going to show you a piece, or at least part of it. It's, a little, it's about three minutes. I might show half of it. I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them. They couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw. My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. Mm -hmm. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, looks sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. So there's always a bad guy in a video or a story. Uh, who's the enemy in this one? Who's the enemy? Who's the bad guy? Right? Very complex. <laughs> if your core value is love thyself, then the opposite of that is self-hate. And then everything in between is the gray matter, right? How extreme. We're all, uh, we, we all treat ourselves lesser than when we're like critical of ourselves. We all are, are there, but, you know, to go to the extreme of self-sabotage, right? Which, for example, maybe not all their audience goes that far. So you might be thinking, I don't are all of them in that place? No. The person who loves themselves, has no emotional issues, or that's perfect, so to speak, can still watch this and go, I know someone like that. That's my mom. Or, so they feel they're like they're part of this tribe, and so they're connecting everybody together. That's what you're experiencing. This is going beyond a video. This is actual experience, okay? And that's what you want to get to. So at the end of the day, we're talking about a bar of soap, people, okay? Don't tell me you can't do this with your brand. If a bar of soap can do it, you can do it. It's just a decision you have to make. And just to contrast this, this is a Unilever product. Well, so is this. <laughs> completely different message, completely different user, completely different story. This kid's on a different channel. His mom's somewhere else, right? His mom is the Dove mom, right? The, the Dove mom would never be caught dead buying this stuff. It, it's, at the end of the day, it's just pretty much the same thing. It's a bunch of chemicals, right? But we make these brand associations. They're powerful. And are there any B2B SaaS platforms here? Yeah? Um, and any blockchain people? Yeah? See, I see a lot of problems in this area, especially with B2Bs, because what's happening is you guys will look, you'll focus on sodium chloride, and you'll be like, we have the best sodium chloride. It's shipped in from Utah every day, fresh. And everyone's like, I don't care. Tell me a story, dude. So, <clears throat> How many people are doing this with your videos already? All the stuff I've kind of covered. How many feel that you're doing this already? Two hands went up. Great. How many would you like to? How many? Just a couple more? Okay, more. Okay, good. Um, focus on that creative gap. Focus on emotions. 
reconsider you know, demanding more from your video marketing strategy. And if you guys aren't sure where to start after this, uh, I got a little download you can go and grab um, and get into thinking about the emotions of your brand and how you want to tell that story. The bottom line here is I just want you to think about and walk away with is don't wait for intent, create intent. Do you remember what the first car looked like? Model T Ford? What did it look like? A horse carriage. It didn't look like a car. It did not look like a Tesla. <laughs> I'm trying to help you guys get to Tesla before everyone else does. That's, that's all I'm talking about, right? Because like both work, both will get you somewhere across town, but one's gonna be kind of nice and people are gonna like it and they're gonna wanna get in that car with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.